evening, everyone. Um, I am Robert Yonner, curator and registrar here at the National Arts Club. And on and and on behalf of the president, the executive director, the board of governors, and the exhibitions committee, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the National Arts Club and this special evening celebrating Joseph Kasuth. Before we begin the evening's program, there are two people I would like to acknowledge whose dedication kept this event moving forward during a time when planning ahead seemed impossible. Um, first, um, Yi Nan Cheng, who was our first contact with the Kasuth Studio and was so gracious and generous in his enthusiasm for this event, and the wonderful Cindy Smith, Who's <laughs> Cindy, whose goodwill, attention, and unstoppable work mode made it possible. Thank you. <laughs> it is now I have an added pleasure to introduce the executive director of the National Arts Club, Ben Hartley. Thank you, Robert. Good evening. Um, Robert Yana has been with the National Arts Club for, he says, 35 years. Uh, he was dropped on our stoop uh, by a stork. Uh, he has filled every job here at the National Arts Club, literally every job. Um, he is our curator, our conservator, our uh, moral compass, our guide, um, our friend. And this evening would not be possible without Robert's work, and I want to thank him for that. <laughs> for those of you who haven't been here before or who don't know us, the National Arts Club is a 501c3. We're a non-profit. We're a private club with public programs. We have 150 free programs every year in this very room. Tomorrow there'll be a program, archaeology program about the Inca Empire. In the evening, a program about the design market. Friday night, a fashion program about eyewear, the history of eyewear. So we have 16 arts committees, 150 programs, 40,000 New Yorkers come here every year for free. Um, the National Arts Club has had a long association with the arts. We've been holding a version of this dinner, the Medal of Honor, since 1906. The first artist honored was Robert Henry. You would have passed a portrait of his on the way up the grand stairs. Um, Robert Henry was honored in 1906 in what was downstairs at the time, the men's grill. Um, since then, we've honored many, many artists in many, many fields. Um, the most recent of which was the dance legend Judith Jamison. Uh, over the years, we've also uh, honored people such as um, singers Placida Domingo, Marianne Anderson, filmmakers Spike Lee and Sidney Lamette, uh, others including Lynn manuel Miranda, Tennessee Williams, Margaret Atwood, and fashion designers Narcissa Rodriguez and Anna Sui. All of these people have been honored in this very room. And tonight, we're particularly thrilled to add Joseph Kasuth to this historic list of art artists. For those of you who don't know the history of members, you'll have to just bear with me because you do. The history of this room, 1876, this is where Governor Samuel Tilden two-term governor of New York State, found that he was the president of the United States. 1876, he won the popular vote. Unfortunately, he lost the electoral vote in something that everyone agreed was a terrible thing and they swore it would never happen again. <laughs> Tilden, um, so Tilden uh, did many things. Um, he was a supporter of the arts and he left behind this beautiful clubhouse that was converted from a mansion into a clubhouse in 1905, 1906. Today, we're in the Grand Gallery, surrounded by works from the Steve Martin Collection. These are indigenous Australian artists um, who've created these works in the last 20 years. 
and I was communicating with Steve, and I said to him, tonight there are going to be over 100 really important people from the art world here um, looking at your works, honouring Joseph Kasuth. And he said, I love that guy, Kasuth. So, <laughs> uh, so um, Steve would have been here, but he had a murder in his building. Um, <laughs> And you'll have to forgive the name dropping. Um, Oprah always told me it was a bit gauche to name drop, but I think you'll forgive me. Um, tonight, my job is to simply play master of ceremonies to welcome you all here. Um, we'll have a number of speakers, and um, the first of which is Natalia Kolodzai, who is the chair of fine arts and exhibitions at the National Arts Club. Natalia, please come to the podium. Dear guests, on behalf of Fine Arts Committee and Exhibition Committee of the National Arts Club, I would like to welcome you to the presentation of the Medal of Honor for the Achievements in Fine Arts, honoring one of the pioneers of conceptual and installation art, Joseph Kasut. Since the 50s, on an annual basis, the National Arts Club has recognized more than 65 outstanding individuals in fine arts, including Salvador Dali, Louis Nevelson, Thomas Hart Benton, Buckminster Fuller, Raphael Sawyer, I am Pei, Robert Motherwell, Alice Neal, Red Grooms, Louis Bourgeois, George Siegel, Van Thiebaud, John Chamberlain, James Rosenquist, Noam June Pike, Frank Stella, Chuck Close, Ilya and Emilia Kabakov, Robert, Wil Robert Wilson, Faith Ringold, and most recently, in 2018, Louis Dodd. These artists work in diverse media, including paintings, sculpture, installation, performance, and photography, contemplating a wide range of issues. They differ in many respects, meaning in, in and within art, the process, the place of personal experience, the influence of geography and generations, the role of politics in art. However, they all add to the global chorus of modern and contemporary art. This selection is the outlet for affirmation and celebration of creative spirit. Joseph Kasut is known for creating art that makes you think for his interest in the relationship between words and objects, between language and meaning. In 65, he created his famous conceptual work, One and Three Chairs, which, was which displayed one actual chair, its photograph, and the text definition of the word chair, emphasizing on the idea over the physical object and what makes art, art. This work was a milestone in the development of conceptual art, influencing a generation of artists around the world. Over five decades, Kasut created a large body of artworks that explored how we experience, comprehend, and respond to the language. His pieces have been exhibited across the world Kasut's significant role in art history will continue to impact the artists of the generations to follow. Tonight, I'm very proud and honored to welcome Joseph Kasut as a recipient of the Medal of Honor for Achievements in Fine Art and welcome him to the National Arts Club family. Thank you. Uh, we have some terrific speakers here today, but at first I want to share with you a bit of history. Um, if you've ever been on a tour of the National Arts Club with me, you would have come to my office and you would have seen this. It's 100 years old, plus, maybe. And strangely, it is not a five minute timer, as you would think, it's four minutes and 50 seconds, five zero. It's missing 10 seconds. And everyone who comes into my office, I ask why. Two people in four years have got it right. 
I'm going to pose that question to all of you. If I've been on the tour with you before, you cannot answer. And I'm going to give you the answer at the end of the speeches. I'm holding this up because we have some brilliant speakers. They were chosen for their brilliance. They were also chosen for their brevity. <laughs> and so this is a reminder of that. Um, so um, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Terry Smith. Um, sometimes in life, you get to meet people you've read about for a long time, and you get to sit next to them, and you find out they're terrific, incredibly influential people. All that you've read about them is true. Dr. Terry Smith is one of those people. And I'll tell you why. He's been a professor at many organizational institutions. He's currently at the Andrew W. Mellon. He's the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Contemporary Art History and Theory at the University of Pittsburgh. He was also at the University of New South Wales, the School of Visual Arts, New York, the University of Sydney, and many other locations. He was the Getty Scholar, a regular contributor to art journals, magazines, and newspapers. He's been on the board of the Andy Warhol Museum. How he finds time, I don't know. He's also a current member of the Carnegie Museum of Art. Um, why Dr. Smith is special to me, he also was a founding member, board member of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, which I grew up in. And as a young man, I went to the Museum of Contemporary Art, and it was thanks to Dr. Smith's work, setting up that museum with many others, that I started wondering about this world of the art world and artists. And um, so it's particularly wonderful for me to have him here, the man who really started my interest and fascination with the arts, and for him to speak about Joseph Kasuda. Terry. Thank you, Ben. It's great to meet another Australian. Um, I miss this uh, company. I'm also an American citizen. I'm proud of that, equally proud of that. It's a great honour to be able to speak on uh, Joseph's behalf, especially since we've known each other since 1972, as I'll tell you uh, in a moment. I'm going to talk about what I say, one and three things I know about Joseph Kassouz, or four reasons why his art deserves this award. Now, the title evokes a work that Joseph did not refer to in his film, but it's a work that is iconic, it's from 1965, it's called One and Three Chairs. You can immediately bring it to your minds. A simple wooden chair sits against the wall. To our left, as we look at it, a life-size black and white photograph of the same chair. On the right, an enlarged photocopy of the entry for the word chair from the dictionary. So, three chairs are visible from, um, visible in a sense, in three different registers. They constitute, in a sense, the fourth chair, the one chair that he spoke about, one and three chairs, and that is the concept chair. It's in our mind's eye, the concept chair. To me, however, the real achievement of this and similar works by Joseph and a few others at the time is that they make visible the act of having a concept, of conceptualizing as such. They make us aware of this process precisely as we do it. We come to see the world through the concepts that we use to see it. We are released from Plato's cave. We see ourselves seeing, and we know ourselves knowingly. So this is the first reason why Joseph's art is so worthy of this award. Because alongside very few others, he precipitated a breakthrough in the history of art. Speaking as an art historian now. But he did so by going back to the basics of art, that is to the practices of seeing, of knowing and showing at their most elemental and therefore at their most conceptual. So Ed Reinhardt was his chief guide 
to the elemental, to the stripped down aesthetic of, of his work. And likewise, Marcel Duchamp was his inspiration for the conceptual aspects. But this work, One and Three Chairs, like all the other ones that he shows you in the film, went beyond anything that Ad Reinhardt imagined. It was a kind of ready-made. Because as a work, it's not confined to the chair that Joseph chose in 1965, along with that photograph and the photocopy that he took then. It's not a fixed artifact embodied in the version we have in the Museum of Modern Art, which occasionally shows this work. It very rarely shows conceptual art. It's an institution which still has to catch up with conceptualism, in my view, by the way. The point of Joseph's project at that time was that any chair will do. Take your own photograph of the chair, um, put it on the wall, and the work is re-instantiated. This is a substitutive logic that's available to everybody, and it applies to every object. You can have shovels, do shop shovels and repeat those. It also applies to concepts such as time. You saw one of his works, one and five uh, clocks. Art uh, as idea, as idea, as he said before. So this brings us to the second reason why this medal is so appropriate, the second breakthrough. Joseph didn't just do this for one work of art. He applied the logic to art, capital A, itself. By taking the concept of art and the plethora of concepts associated with it as the object of his practice. Not as the object, but the object of his practice. Conceptual art, at its core, demands reconceptualization of art as such. This doesn't happen just once as an idea uh, that will resonate forever. It's not about making objects. It's about pursuing a practice. Now, Joseph has done this for over 50 years, unceasingly, tautologically, some would say relentlessly. It's a no hold bars, take no prisoner, you heard it before, approach. Consequential art cannot be made in any other way. One of Joseph's most famous sayings from 1969 is that all art after Duchamp is conceptual in nature. The drop in my voice is our parentheses, because art only exists conceptually. Very famous comment. Can we say that all art after Cassus, and including Cassus's subsequent work, is post-conceptual in nature? Can we say that? I think we can, but with the writer, that in today, art's concepts, like all worldly concepts, are coming from everywhere, not only from the history of Western thought, from analytical philosophy that's been so important to, uh, as an inspirational field for Joseph. This third idea, the third idea, takes us to more personal realms, to stories about the lives of conceptual artists. Two minutes to do those stories, if I may. Uh, like others, I owe Joseph some important debts. debts. We met by chance in August 1972. Imagine Nadi Airport. When you flew from Sydney to New York, I was en route to taking up a fellowship at the Institute of Fine Arts here in this great city. In those days, planes had to stop to refuel in the middle of the Pacific. We were waiting quietly at the airport in Nadi, looking at this photograph of Queen Elizabeth in her yellow dress and making anti-British comments. Um, and in walked this guy with flaxen hair and this white suit, smiling away, and he decided he'd talk to us. And the reason that my wife is very beautiful, she was and then, and she is, she was then, she still is. I think that was nothing to do with my hair, which was down to here, but anyway. It quickly emerged that we both knew the Australian members of our language group, particularly Ian Byrne, quite well. So shortly after settling in New York, Joseph persuaded me to join the art and language group. This was an experience that changed my life and has enriched my work ever since. 
I recall meetings in his loft on Grand Street, where the studio was a vast room, um, at least the length of this room, probably not quite the width, but at least the length of this room. It was empty, except for a few chairs and a very big brand new photocopier. Right? Um, we talk for a while, this group. We bring out our typewriters, we type out statements, then we share them with each other, we photocopy and then we type some more. The loft was memorable for various reasons, particularly the wall of the bathroom right next to the kitchen. For some reason it was transparent, this wall. <laughs> My wife has never forgiven Joseph for that. Anyway, these were the years of the Art Workers Coalition, the Artists Meeting for Cultural Change, they were the years of the Fox magazine that we set up against October. Uh, magazine, years of highly productive collective practice and volatile disunity. The great thing about collectives is that they generate extraordinarily powerful individuals, as we see in this uh, tonight. When the New York branch of art language fell apart, Joseph and I actually were on different sides of the debate. We didn't speak for 20 years. But we did get together after my dear and difficult friend Ian Byrne uh, died in Australia in 1993, trying to rescue his daughter from our surf. We have pursued our dear and no longer so difficult friendship ever since. How many books have you published this year, Terry? I've only done two. Look at these, for example. <laughs> I'm sure many similar feelings um, are shared by people in this room. So I've spelled out three reasons why Joseph so richly deserves this award. The fourth one, the one, is the sum of all these three. It's for you to think about, to see in your mind's eye. I'll give you a hint. It's the concept Joseph pursues. Please raise our glasses to celebrate um, a great artist and his work. Thank you. Thank you. Well, obviously the eight time worked really well on timing. Um, so let's see if Charlotte can do a little better. <laughs> um, Charlotte Kent, Dr. Charlotte Kent, uh, is known to us all here at the club as a governor, as the co-chair of the Young Members, as the co-founder of the Artist Fellows Program here, um, as a, one of our many, uh, one of our greatest supporters. Um, Charlotte, uh, in her day job, is an assistant professor of visual arts at Montclair University, State University, a writer and an in-demand moderator. Please welcome Dr. Charlotte Kent. I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth to praise Joseph Kosuth. The following is in honor of you instead. To the best of my ability, I have taken a page from your book, from our initial Brooklyn Rail conversation about existential time at Sean Kelly Gallery, to our discussions in Venice on dot point period at Castelli Gallery, I have been inspired. What follows is produced from excerpts by authors you know, a few of my own favorites, with a nod to our other speakers tonight, too. What is art? What is a speech? Why should there be something rather than nothing? Because we are in the world, we are condemned to meaning, and we cannot do or say anything without its acquiring a name in history. The notion of what constitutes a work of art is as old as the concept of art itself. We were under the impression that we had it all figured out until the early years of the 20th century when, adopting a pseudonym, a 29-year-old French artist submitted a commercially manufactured object to an art exhibition in New York and forced us to ask the question all over again. The certitudes and unshakable basic assumptions of former ages have been swept away. We are being exposed to a catastrophe of meaning. Let's not hurry to hide this exposure under pink, blue, red, or black silks. 
everything is going to become more and more critical. And artists can really begin to cherish the just hope that humanity will at last rise up in a mass and learn to read. The social bond is linguistic, but is not woven with a single thread. Language signifies when instead of copying thought, it lets itself be taken apart and put together again by thought. Genius is a talent for producing that for which no definite rule can be given, and not an aptitude in the way of cleverness for what can be learned according to some rule, and that, consequently, originality must be its primary property. Since there may also be original nonsense, its products must at the same time be models, be exemplary, and consequently, though not themselves derived from imitation, they must serve that purpose for others as a standard or rule of estimating. To ask for an explanation is to explain the obscure by the more obscure. But is incomprehensibility really something so unmitigatedly contemptible and evil? Ultimately, aesthetic comportment is to be defined as the capacity to shudder. No one can think a thought for me the way no one can don my hat for me. Thoughts come at random and go at random. No device for holding on to them or for having them. The upheavals in progress affected the very structure of the psychic apparatus. At any street corner, the feeling of absurdity can strike any man in the face. No longer does it feel like our time, because our cannot stretch to encompass its contrariness. The work of art stumbles inevitably into the empty space. I am evading a definition. If it is defined, it will be fixed, and it must not be fixed. It was necessary now to carry everything a step further. Thank you, Joseph, for taking that next step. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, it's now my great pleasure. Actually, I'm gonna answer the question that I was already asked now about the eight timer. So I'll remind you of the question. Five minute timer, it actually measures four minutes and 50 seconds, five zero. What happened to the 10 seconds? I used to say that there was the Google interview question that I'd ask, ask members. We actually have five members who work at Google, none of them got the answer. So here's your chance. Does anyone know what happened to those 10 seconds? Not a soul, okay, I will tell you. As we learnt in science, glass is a liquid. Glass expands over time, the aperture has got bigger, and the sand goes through faster. Normally in that four minute, 50 seconds, I would tell you the entire history of the National Arts Club when we'd go on a tour. So, with, our, with that, our final speaker tonight, um, it's my great pleasure to uh, invite to the podium Dr. Francis Nauman, a scholar, curator, and art dealer specializing in the art of the Dada movement and the Surrealist periods with an MFA in, uh, degree in painting from the Art Institute of Chicago and a, and a PhD in art history from the Graduate Center of New York City. Please welcome Dr. Francis Nauman, a man who certainly knows about the shape-shifting properties of surrealist eight-timers. <laughs> I imagine he got that MFA and PhD from my Wikipedia entry uh, because I hid that for many years. I didn't know, I don't know who wrote that and put it into my, Wiki I don't even know who wrote the Wikipedia entry for that matter. But if you get time when you go home tonight, you should read Joseph's Wikipedia entry. It'll take reserve some time because it's long, but well worth the effort. Uh, what I wanted to say tonight actually has to do with something that occurred to me in this very building, uh, I think 24 years ago, or 25 years ago, in 1997, I think it was, I was asked to accept an award on behalf of the California artist Beatrice Wood. 
Uh, she happened to have then been 104 years old, couldn't make the trip from the West Coast. So I was asked to accept this award. But I had written quite a bit about Beatrice over the years, maybe articles, books, everything. And I thought to myself, and I, I hate the idea of repeating myself. So in a crowd like this, I rose from my chair not thinking I had anything more to say about this woman. But something happened almost like a miracle. Uh, she was a potter and well known for these luster glazes. And her dealer at the time, Garth Clark, had brought about 10 pieces of hers to put around the room. And one of them caught my eye as I was coming up to the podium. And I suddenly understood what I would say. I realized that she was her pottery. Uh, almost literally, because, you know, when you describe a pot, even to this day, you, you know, you describe it as having a lip at the top, a mouth, uh, it has a shoulders, a body, handles from the word hand, all the way down to feet. And even though it has these kind of anthropomorphic ideas behind it, I never knew and understood to what degree Beatrice herself could be that pot, because she specialized in luster glazes. And if anyone ever had the opportunity of meeting this woman, you know that she wore only Indian saris and was bedecked with Indian jewelry. She sparkled like her vases. And I realized, my god, she is her work. So coming here this evening, I decided to what extent could I say that Joseph Kasuth is his work. So in order to enter into the same kind of exercise I gave myself, you more or less have to go on this kind of uh, thought experiment, not, not anywhere near as interesting as Einstein's famous uh, trains passing one another, but on an experiment of thinking of Joseph being his work. So you have to imagine him standing against that wall, and to his left, a photograph of him. And to the right, you have to imagine a dictionary definition, something that tells us who he is. So. If I have to be responsible for creating this work, I have to then decide what do you put on that plaque. First of all, it's sort of fun because it could be on black ground and white letters, which most of his definitions are perfect for him since he used to dress in white and now he's switched to black. So at least you get that far. But then what do you say about this guy? And I taught art history for nearly 30 years. And in my first classes, in contemporary art, I used to sketch out for the students the artists that I felt were the ones that everything else hinged on. And it was impossible to do such a talk without mentioning, of course, Matisse, who you would then describe as a great colorist of the 20th century, Picasso, uh, the classicist and structuralist. But you couldn't, of course, not in my class anyway, omit Duchamp, because he was a great thinker and introduced ideas into art. And then, by extension, I would bring maybe Andy Warhol in it, even go all the way up to as far as Jeff Koons. And all of those artists have something in common. Whatever you say about them, they did something that other artists before them didn't do. Uh, even Jeff Koons, I know a lot of people don't like him, but he did something <laughs> major. I mean, he, he, he took all of us who think we know about art and think, we have an idea of what's good and what's bad, and he took the bad stuff, the stuff we condemned, to the dustbin of history, kitsch, and forced it into our face in such a way that you had to rethink it. Any artist who causes you to rethink has carved a position in history. Now, once I made that kind of analysis, it's almost like doing Alfred Barr's famous chart of 20th century art. You omit and forget one giant chapter, and that is abstraction. The one thing that the artists of the 20th century contributed was this whole mode of expression that didn't exist before their time. So when you talk about the artists who fit in that, I usually started, of course, with Kandinsky, the first, and then talked about Jackson Pollock, and maybe extended it to Frank Stella. But there is an aspect of one of those three artists that I actually think Joseph shares a lot in common with. No one will normally believe me when I say this until I explain it, and it's actually Pollock. You know, all of the art theory that developed around Jackson Pollock was all about formalism. Form had to follow the function of whatever you were doing. So, if you think of it in those kind of literal terms, 
if a painting is composed of just drips and splashes all across its entire surface, then it's doing exactly what paint should do. It is, in a way of speaking, redefining itself. And if you compare that to Joseph's work, like, let's say, the five words composed only of five words in neon, all of blue, five words in blue neon, or any of the other works that are self-descriptive like that, they are, for all intents and purposes, doing exactly what Jackson Pollock did in his pictures. So, uh, and one work in particular that was shown earlier that I love uh, is called An Object Self-Defined, because that work doesn't go beyond itself. It's telling you exactly what it is when you look at it and nothing more. So, after having said that, I've now come to what I think should be in that third plaque on the right-hand side in the one and three Joseph Kossuths. Uh, it should say Joseph Kossuth, conceptual artist, who used words and language to create an art that uh, describes itself. I better put my glasses on, I realize I'm not as good. Uh, that describes itself uh, as a literal manifestation of its existence. With Kossuth, what you see is what you read, and what you read is what you get. Nothing more, nothing less. He is the ultimate beneficiary of philosophical principles articulated by Ludwig Wittgenstein and Walter Benjamin, as well as ideas introduced into the history of 20th century art by Marcel Duchamp. But possibly even so, curiously enough, ideas expressed by critics in response to paintings by Jackson Pollock. Now, if I actually did this as a literal thing on a board, I'd get booed out of the room, but at least you know the reasons why I threw Pollock in there. He is a recipient of many honors, but considering the circumstances in which we find ourselves this evening, recipient also of the very prestigious 2022 Medal of Honor Achievement in Fine Arts from the National Art Clubs of New York. I would also put at the end of that that he has a dog with the single greatest name anyone's ever given a dog in history. His dog is named Dogma. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, events like tonight take place with work from many, many people. I'd like to briefly recognize some of those people. Um, my colleague, uh, John Arama, who's a general manager. Um, Chef Lynn Bound, who is yeah. um, uh, John Lopez and Louis Payano in our food and beverage services and all the staff have really put this event and all the other events that take place at the club. I'd like to thank them for their work. <laughs> it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce you, Mr. David Doty, President of the National Arts Club, who will come up to the podium and present the Medal of Honor. Well, good evening, everyone. I think this is fabulous to see this many people here tonight. Mr. Kasup, you should be honored. I mean, I've been in many Medals of Honor. This is quite a crowd. Right, uh, it's so wonderful to see so many familiar and, and if I might, um, important faces. So on behalf of the National Arts Club, uh, its board of directors and its members, it's my privilege to officially present to you uh, the, uh, the tonight's award. Um, listening tonight, what, what I've heard is you're self-defining and you're consequential. That's not bad. Uh, <laughs> As our previous speakers have made clear, Mr. Kasuth is a singular talent. He has led the transformation of modernism. He pioneered conceptual art and installations, all of which we grew up looking at and trying to find the meaning of, and explored the interplay of language and meaning. His work stand alongside that of a remarkable group of artists, those who have changed the face of American art. Mr. Kasuth, Stand, joins an exemplary band uh, who have received this award uh, as we keep to our club's commitment to recognize art of our own time as well as respecting that of our history. Other recipients who Mr. Kasuth now joins include Rauschenberg, Lichtenstein, Kuhns, 
who was just mentioned, and Ringgold. I now present the National Arts Club Medal of Honor to Joseph Kasuth. Come up, please. It like my tennis star heroes do. There's chocolate inside. Oh, <laughs> let's hope. I'm diabetic, but I won't let it stop me. Well, I guess this is the moment I say something, but I prepared nothing. Absolutely nothing. Although I, my very first show in a gallery was the word nothing from 12 different dictionaries. It's true. And, and I picked the perfect place for it, Los Angeles. <laughs> no way. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I always like to tell the joke, but I'm trying to remember whether or not I remember it completely. But anyway, we'll try it. Some of you may have heard it. Some of you may have heard me. Um, it's a conversation between man and God. You know this one? No, no. Uh, yeah. A conversation between man and God. And man said, well, listen, God, for you, what's 100 million years? God said, well, for me, it's only a minute. And man said, wow. He said, well, listen, God, um, what's 100 million dollars? God said, oh, for me, it's just a penny. And man said, well, listen, God, <laughs> can I have that penny? God said, sure, just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that joke, um, and I, I heard it in the best way, which was that I had a show in a museum in, um, oh, God, oh, Hamburg. And, um, and it was, you know, one of the really, uh, I, had to, I had to dance with the wife of the mayor, who was obese and stepped on my feet continually. And I couldn't take it anymore. And so I ran into a back room, and this was a very large villa. And I was by myself, sort of like. <laughs> and at um, a certain moment, I see some guy with white hair coming through the door, looking quite a bit like, Albert Einstein. And I looked at him and he said, are you the artist? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I am the nephew of Albert Einstein. And, and, and I heard that you um, collect jokes. And I, I just thought you might like to have the favorite joke of my uncle Albert. And I said, oh, very much. <laughs> anyway, so that was the joke. Um, my, the other favorite joke I heard, and I, I really hope I don't offend anyone, but um, in honor of my two Russian friends who came tonight, I, I thought I was going to tell them later privately, but it's too good to sh not share. And it was um, uh, three dogs. An American dog, a Polish dog, and a Russian dog were together. And the American dog started bragging, saying, well, in my country, I just bark, and I get meat. And um, the Polish dog said, meat? What's meat? And the, and the Russian dog said, bark? What's bark? <laughs> Yeah, all right. Well, um, we could tell jokes for a long time, but I don't think that's what we're supposed to be doing on an August occasion. I want to thank, of course, the membership and the leadership of um, this very special place um, for this, this gift. No honor. And um, I don't have one of these. 
<laughs> so for that, I'm, you know, it would be special in any case, but that makes it even more special. So uh, I don't know, I don't have a lot more to say, but I can keep talking without any problem at all. I, I taught the universities for about a half century. Yeah. Anybody want to ask me any questions? I'm used to that too. But other than that, um, I'm going to just go sit down now because generally I don't stand anywhere near as long as this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.